uh, let's get started. Okay, this is um, in front of each chapter, I will quickly summarize uh, what you are about to see. So this is supposed to be a brush up on reinforcement learning, usually abbreviated as RL. Um, the idea is that um, I basically show you that uh, minimal, um, uh, in a minimal way, what you need to know, know about reinforcement learning, which is uh, the Bellman uh, equation or um, the uh, action value um, uh, function, uh, action state value function. But uh, you'll see the, uh, the formula later on. So the most important takeaways from this bit is that you learn what is a function approximation and what is an update rule. Okay. Uh, Stefan, uh, real quick, can you see my cursor? Yes, I can see your cursor. Okay, all right. Um, yeah. So uh, this um, reinforcement learning framework essentially um, is uh, made of uh, an agent and an environment. So you have two sides um, to this uh, framework. One is the side where you take an action and then you experience something in the environment. And this basically tells you the new state and the reward that you got um, after taking this action. Um, yeah, so this is like a broad overview. And what we in particular interested in this um, talk especially is uh, the state value function which we call q um, uh, yeah which is computed um, using uh, s which is the state and a and we also have a policy function so this policy function basically tells you based on s what is the probability of taking action a um, just a, a little bit of heads up, I will most certainly abuse the notation with the policy uh, uh, function because uh, it might just look like a deterministic, but it could also be probabilistic. Um, yeah, so what else do you need to know exactly? So the main goal of reinforcement learning is that you um, collect as many rewards as possible, which means you try over your lifetime, over an episode, however you want to call it, you try to maximize uh, your rewards. And, and this is done by, so the learning it, itself is done by a so-called policy iteration algorithm. What does that thing do? Um, so after initialization, which could be something random or just setting um, the, the values to zero. Um, you, you have the policy evaluation, which is sometimes also called prediction. And then you have the policy improvement, which is sometimes also called control. Um, so why do we actually want to learn this Q value here? So this Q value essentially tells you, uh, based on your state and action, how much your uh, future return um, is if you if you end up in this state and and here you already see what i've been mentioning before this is um uh now more looking like it's something deterministic but uh it's the same policy function as down here um so please forgive me this uh, slight abuse of notation here um yeah so we basically iterate through this algorithm. So first we compute the Q value up here, and then we fix the Q value, and then we, we update the, the policy function. So this suggests that we essentially just iterate through the states and just choose the action that yields the maximum uh, um, Q value. And then you hope if you iterate through those two, and um, that you at some point converge and this would be your uh, um, um, uh, Q value and policy function that yields the maximum return for your agent. Um, now we're already coming to the function approximation. So as you might have wondered that the slides, like the title of this talk, 
mentioned deep reinforcement learning. So where does this deep come into play? This is, a, is exactly here with the function approximation. So the problem is if our state space is way too large, that there's no chance that we could compute the, the Q value in a, uh, uh, in an exact way. So we have to start approximating it. The same goes for the policy function. And how do we approximate them? Um, there are different ways to approximate them using function approximation. But the one that we basically are looking here at is a, a neural network uh, approximation. So essentially what the input will be uh, is a, a state, the current state and the action. And based on the prediction weights in the Q case, um, you output whatever is supposed to be the approximation of, of the left-hand side here. And analogous, uh, you have the same situation for the policy function. Um, yeah. And those neural networks are basically uh, parameterized by, by those two corresponding thetas. Um, yeah. And our goal or something that we hope is that we could generalize from seen states to unseen states. Good. Okay. And uh, yeah, the next part we'll talk about the update function, where um, where we show like a way how we could update, um, for instance, the, this Q value. Um, yeah. So as an example, um, I chose here the Q learning update rule. Um, some of you guys might have heard of this. Um, I'm just like taking this uh, Q learning update rule and coming back to it also throughout the presentation, just like to give you some high level notion on what we're about to do and what are we changing, what the paper is tweaking and so forth. Um, okay, I'm using um, no colors so far. So later on, I will also use colors uh, in this update rule. Um, let me quickly walk you through. So essentially you have the old state and on the left is the new, uh, new state, um, 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 new state action value. And you update it using this entire thingy and alpha itself is just uh, a step size. And here, can I, no, um, this R is the immediate reward after you start off at S at the state S and take action A, and then you end up at S prime. So this tells you what reward you get if you do that. And then you have, in the end, you could summarize this entire thing as a, some sort of error where you basically subtract the, the current uh, Q value. And now the question is, what is this max Q value of the next uh, state? So what we're doing here is essentially pausing for a bit, and then we look at all the possible actions and we choose the action that yields the maximum Q value for um, um, when we end up at the next state. And since we're looking into the future, we, need, we also have this discounting factor. And this discounting factor essentially um, changes um, the, the, the setting, whether you want to be looking really far ahead into the future or whether you care about like the, the closest um, uh, rewards that you could obtain. Good. So have a, have a good look um, at this update rule because this will be returning. Okay. So this was the introduction bit about reinforcement learning. So now we're going on to meta learning and I want just to bring you guys up to speed on meta learning and also somehow give you a justification why this might be an important uh, research area. So the takeaway here, as you see, is just getting a basic understanding of what meta learning means without any, um, without going way too much into uh, uh, formulas. Okay. So those are essentially the three questions that I want to uh, answer, which is what is meta learning? And why should we care about meta learning? And what is a task? This is like, especially 
important because throughout all the papers, we keep on talking about task and we need like to get a good grasp on, on the notion what the task mean. Okay. So why should you care about um, meta learning? So the current state, uh, for instance, could be if you, if you look at this uh, transformer model and um, for information, it's not really important that you can read like the details of this model. But um, I just want to emphasize that to run this transformer model, you need like a humongous amount of data which is labeled in order to train that um, big model successfully. Which in itself could be a limitation in case um, we don't have uh, that much data. And here's just like an, uh, an example of, of a rather big uh, labeled uh, data set, which is the ImageNet. I believe most of you guys will probably already know that. Um, let's ha have a look at the bottom right hand corner, or hand side corner. So the, the, the part that makes like the biggest fuss at the moment is the big data um, corner where we have like a lot of data which is um, labeled and ready to use and we could um, get improvements on that. But what if you have a task that you want to, um, to learn and you don't have like many data sets so then you end up like in, in this data tail or in the small data area. It would be kind of interesting to see a way that uh, enables us to move away from large data sets into uh, a regime where you need less data in order to learn quite well. And now I have a, a nice example of a few short learning. Uh, the main idea here is um, essentially I want to show you this is a two-way and a three-shot uh, classification task. And the question to you guys is, if you look at the training data for like a few seconds, and then if you go over to a test data point, the question now is um, to you guys. So we're basically emulating uh, the fact that you guys will be the model. Um, how would you classify this uh, test data point? Is it like a Brock or is it a uh, Cezanne? So in order to make it a bit more interactive, I suggest that you click on the participant tab and then you click on, uh, on either the, the green button for Brock or the red button for Cezanne. And I'll let you do that. Uh, Okay, uh, we see a convergence towards the, the green dot. Thank you uh, for uh, being this active. It's lovely to see that. Okay, um, yeah, it's, it's a Brock. That's, a, uh, that's the correct solution. So it's kind of interesting to see that the majority of you guys that are uh, listening here um, could manage to classify that correctly and you only looked at those three uh, six pictures and that was sufficient for you to classify that and the question um, um, arises uh, could we also teach a machine to do that because what you used in order to classify this test data point it's um, some prior experience. You probably can't even really tell what sort of prior experience you exactly use, but like you somehow experienced enough life, let's put it that way, that you were able to easily uh, classify this data point, test data point. So in the sense of uh, machine learning, we, we're moving towards uh, meta learning in order to try to teach the machine the same behavior as you basically showed us right now. Okay, uh, let me quickly introduce you what a task is, including some nice pictures. Um, so in, 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 during this presentation, we basically are using a loss function and uh, task is a specific loss function and uh, task specific data set. 
And using those two, we're trying to, to learn a model app uh, with the hyperparameters theta. So as you see uh, down here on the pictures, uh, a task could differ in, 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 in objects. As you see, there are three different objects. And a critical assumption for um, task in the uh, setting of meta learning is that we have uh, a common uh, shared, some common uh, shared uh, structure. Without that, it doesn't really work and we would end up um, benefiting from the old school single task learning. Um, yeah, so the idea, um, just like to contrast single task learning with meta learning. So the idea is that instead of learning just one task, um, we try to learn uh, meta learn all the all three tasks, and then we hope to end up using um, less data. We also hope being um, quicker in, in in learning or adapting towards like a specific task. Okay. Uh, Another thing that is also mentioned here is is that we usually assume that uh, we have mutually exclusive data sets. What that exactly means will um, will be explained um, a bit later on when we basically address this assumption as in trying to remove this assumption. Okay, uh, just another slide for you guys to uh, motivate you why this might be uh, something um, of importance. I roughly scraped like literally, I only took like five to 10 minutes just to, to scrape, like to get like some sort of feeling how hot this topic is at the moment. And if, if I was, if you look at the Google Trends um, scrape that I did, you see a clear picking up after or around uh, 2015 and 2016, it starts to, to build this uh, increasing trend. And if you have a look at the Google, <laughs> Google Scholar scrape, you also see somehow a trend that uh, we're having more and more publication as compared to like, let's say before the millennium started. And uh, disclaimer here, I was just looking for the term meta learning uh, in those two cases. So it could be that we had like just meta reinforcement learning and then the scrape wouldn't even pick it up. So we could have even more um, um, uh, publications that would end up in a proper scrape in here. Okay. So now we're coming uh, to the meta learning intuition. And I found this lovely picture somewhere in one of those papers. I think it was buried down in the in an appendix. Never mind. I find it it basically summarizes really well what meta learning means in form of a picture. Um, let's say a task would be hiking, sledging, standing, walking, cycling, or even uh, riding a horse. So. If we just meta train on those tasks or on this task distribution, we want somehow to quickly learn how to ice skate, for instance. And you might ask yourself, what is the commonality between uh, this set and this new task? Because it's essentially not the same thing, right? But you could argue that this act of um, ice skating is some sort of a combination of walking and sledging and this is how we hope to teach the machine how to adapt rather quick to this new unseen task. Um, let's do a quick dive into uh, meta learning, uh, a model agnostic meta learning algorithm. So the notion there is you have this meta learning uh, parameter that basically learns over all over the task distribution in the meta training bit. And the idea is that you have a, a, some sort of double loop. In the inner loop, you basically just optimize for one task. And then you do this for, for instance, task one, task two, and task three. And then in the outer loop, you will basically um, average um, those gradient steps 
and update the, the big theta here. Big as in, it looks rather big on this slide. And uh, yeah, and then in the test, uh, in the meta test uh, stage, you could, for instance, have uh, one of those three uh, tasks that you want to learn. And let's assume if you if we, if we end up somewhere like in the uh, in the middle of those three unseen uh, test tasks, um, we could argue that if you in initialize to to uh, uh, or wait to something that lies around here, we are already rather close to, for instance, um, task two optimal uh, weights. And this way we hope that we end up having just uh, a few uh, update steps using a, um, a simple uh, SGD, for instance, or something else to optimize. Okay, let's go ahead. Um, on this slide, I try to uh, formalize this uh, a tiny bit more. So we essentially have two big uh, uh, things. One is the meta training and the other one is the meta tanning. And I inc also included the meta, meta testing here because uh, usually if you go through the papers, this part um, is usually assumed as to be probably trivial and therefore left um, it's, it gets left out. Um, okay, let's dive in into the meta training. So the meta training essentially has also two steps. And one of those two steps is the meta learning. What are we trying to do in the meta learning thing? Um, we're trying to learn the optimal meta parameters. If we train on the meta training set. So the meta training set basically uh, uh, comprises um, task specific training sets as the one down here. So as, as, as this uh, adaption step um, already uh, alludes to, it's, it's an adaption per training task. So per training task, you essentially compute this um, optimal uh, phi star based on the current meta uh, parameters. And then you go back to the meta parameter and then you average as, as, as I argued here, then you average um, and you end up getting the new uh, meta parameters. Good, and then in the, in the, uh, in the meta tasking uh, stage, you basically toss a new task towards your uh, meta-learned uh, model, and then you want to learn, for instance, uh, how to adapt to this phi star three. And in order to do so, um, we just like to make it uh, crystal clear, we're working on, on an unseen task that hasn't been used during the meta-training. And we, we use the meta-learned parameters and then we basically um, optimize and find this uh, phi star, which is supposed to work pretty well for like one task that you specialize in. And, and this meta tasking part should only take like a few adaption um, uh, update steps. Okay. Um, yeah. So as an example, uh, I'm taking here the model agnostic meta learning uh, paper uh, called MAML. So that, that paper uh, from uh, Chelsea Finn uh, created quite a, a big fuss about meta learning. And we are essentially looking at it as a, as a base model and I want to try um, and make you understand you what is happening here. So essentially, if we, are doing this in the realm of uh, reinforcement learning. Um, we have to again to look at least on a like high level idea um, at such an uh, update rule. So the question here is like what gets updated by this model agnostic meta learning uh, model? Um, I already highlighted here the model is uh, basically meta learning the parameters of our uh, policy approximation. And 
That way, Mammal hopes that if we basically meta learn the parameters of the policy um, approximation, um, that we end up getting some uh, performance uh, boost while doing the the uh, the, the up, um, while uh, updating uh, using the update rule. Uh, so. As I said before, reinforcement learning has two main steps. Um, if you remember at this cone, one is you do the um, prediction part and the other one is the controlling part. So this update rule is, is the prediction and this approximated policy um, is the control, the control part. And I believe this is our first uh, stage where we would um, accept questions from your side uh, and I hope uh, I'll be able to clarify those questions so um, Stefan over to you um, are there yeah, so far questions? in the chat there is nothing so in case someone has a question you can just raise your hand in the participants pane otherwise if everything is clear so far we can also continue with the next one okay so just going through participants, it seems to be clear so far or utterly confused. But if yeah. there are no questions, Stephen, you can go on. Okay. I'm, um, dear uh, listeners, so I, I urge you, if you have like any questions, uh, please ask them right now because um, everything that follows after this is just building on, on top of this. And I want to make sure that you got the main ideas behind either uh, reinforcement learning or uh, meta learning. So I'll give you another few moments to maybe come up with a question and otherwise we, we will continue as suggested by Stefan. Okay, I assume there are no questions or people are too shy or I hopefully did not uh, confuse you too much by this introduction. Let's get started with the first paper, which is the meta-regularized uh, um, uh, mammal. Okay, so again, um, I'm, so the basic notion is we want to introduce some sort of regularization to mammal. And it's not the same regularization as, as, as you already know from the usual deep learning or uh, usual uh, machine learning setting. It's uh, on another, it's on the meta le level. This is why we're talking about meta regularizing. Um, yeah, and this enables us to extend mammal to non-mutually exclusive tasks. So in here, I will explain you what the non-mutually uh, non exclusive task is. And, and uh, the takeaway is, uh, um, is uh, to, to, to see how we enable mammal to, to learn on non-mutually exclusive tasks. Okay. Let me try to explain you what we mean by mutually exclusive tasks. Um, by using my cursor. So we have here as an example, a uh, N-way classification, uh, few shot classification example here. So um, we're trying to classify those pictures and trying to, to learn those. And each line is a, is a specific task. So let's say the first line is task one, the second line is task two. As you see, uh, or might already um, know this is like this this lovely dog here um, is uh, is in both um, task test data sets, but the labels are different. So in the first row, the label for the dog is three, and in the second one, the label is uh, one. And if this is not already the case, we basically force it. Um, the way how we do that is by shuffling the labels. This is what this thingy is uh, supposed to, to, to say. And if, if we do that, 
mammal uh, works quite well. But what if we don't do that? Then we out of a sudden see that we somehow could basically just train on the training data from task one. And then in a zero shot approach, we could essentially already classify the task test data from task two as well, without even like looking at, uh, without ever looking at the um, task two training data. Um, and this is something that we don't really want um, to happen. And they, are, they, um, they introduce uh, two terms. One of them is task overfitting. And the other one is a memorization problem, which is uh, essentially, I hope, intuitively clear what that means if we basically just train on task one, but are able to um, uh, classify two different uh, task test sets. Um, yeah, what else do I want to say here? Yeah, okay. Let me try to explain you what is happening over here with this graphical model. And this graphical model essentially shows the different levels. So the first level here is the meta learning. Um, and I assume that you already know how to read such a, a graphical model by hopefully attending to last terms uh, probabilistic AI. Um, yeah, so this is the, the meta test set. And I hope uh, you'll keep this one in mind because it will uh, sh um, pop up later on as well. And for each, um, while it's doing the meta training, we subsample from the, uh, the task distribution some tasks. And then from that task, we sample both um, uh, task training data and task testing data. And we already set the testing data aside. Okay, so in the training bit, you essentially try to learn um, this um, uh, phi j, uh, which is uh, task specific to task j. And in the testing part, we go through um, all the input values and then we try to predict, hopefully, include um, predict um, this, this y label here by hopefully including the, um, um, the, 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 the uh, adaption uh, um, the adaption phi here and also the meta parameter over here. Okay. Okay. So here you see I already brought um, or I'm already bringing back this update rule. Um, again, just like to uh, re-emphasize where we're working on. We're working on this um, policy approximation, which is hopefully approximated in this case by a deep neural network. And we're basically working on this theta. And let me remove the colors and emphasize on the new parts. Um, I'm grossly simplifying what the meta regularizer does here, just to let you guys know, because they used a lot of uh, information uh, theory and also uh, some upper bounds using the PAC uh, uh, theorems. And, but like the, the big takeaway is already um, summarized on this slide, which is if you look at the normal meta update, um, which happens in the outer loop of the meta training part, is we basically, are updating our meta parameters by using this function, uh, um, uh, grading of this um, loss function. So now the meta regularized um, um, meta update essentially adds this blue term here. What is this blue term, you might ask yourself. In simple terms, you could think of this blue term as a regularizer, uh, as you already know it from the usual machine learning uh, environments. Um, like um, of the likes of the, the, the rich or, or lesser. Um, yeah, so with this KL divergence, we're trying to punish um, uh, the, the thetas that essentially just use the, the meta-trained uh, parameters. What do I mean by that? 
is you see the dashed arrows here. So if we use, um, we don't use those dashed arrows, we essentially just use the, uh, the already learned um, meta parameters. And we just input the stuff into our model and thanks to the meta parameters is already able to classify um, everything correctly in a zero shot manner. And if this is the case, then this KL term is big, which is something that we don't really want since we're trying to uh, minimize um, the loss here. And yeah, vice versa. So the goal is from this regularizer that we actually end up using those dashed lines such that we are probably a tiny bit um, worse off in terms of um, generalization, um, uh, in terms of classifying, but we make big steps towards uh, generalization whilst using those, uh, whilst um, using the meta uh, learned parameters and leveraging the test adaption uh, uh, phi. Okay. Um, I assume you already read what this uh, Q, uh, um, this Q distribution is and this R distribution. Um, yeah, so this, this, this Q distribution uh, basically summarizes uh, that the meta training data into a distribution. Um, and this R is a variation approximation of, of the marginal. What marginal? Uh, you might ask yourself, uh, this is where I invite you guys to go ahead and have a deep dive into this very interesting uh, paper um, that uh, talks about this meta-regulation memo. Uh, okay, so by using this uh, regularization uh, KL term from above, we basically could um, leave this one step out. And now you see that our beloved doc here has the same label in task one as in task two. And it's not only about leaving this, um, this uh, additional step of shuffling the labels out. This also enables us to take, um, uh, take aboard uh, much more data, um, data sets that weren't usable before because we couldn't uh, make them mutually uh, exclusive. For instance, if you have a medical um, a patient and that patient has a, some sort of a medical history and then you try to um, uh, recommend that the patient based on the past uh, uh, history um, what sort of medication that patient might need. And in this setting, you can't really use uh, label shuffling. And now with this new regime, you can also um, learn, meta learn those situations with the patients. Okay, so again, this example here, task one and task two are now non mutually exclusive because of the labelings on the right side. Okay, now we're already uh, converging towards the uh, results. So what they did, I'm showing just one bit of, of their results just to like show how powerful this is. They um, uh, ran everything on Omniglot. Omniglot and you probably already heard of this data set. So let's go on. Um, so here you see two tables. So one of those two table um, yeah, just to clear up the context, we already meta trained our uh, thetas. So now we're receiving a new task, which is not, which was unseen before. So now in this, but somehow related to them, um, they have like um, shared commonalities between the, the trained tasks. So now I want to adapt to this new um, meta task task, so to say. So before I update, they had the glorious idea to see how well um, the, the, the algorithms work. And we're just basically having a look at Mammal over here. Without even um, doing the test adaption step, we end up having an accuracy of 99%.
And here clearly Mammal uh, already learned everything uh, um, um, overfitted to the task and is not really using uh, any training data because we haven't trained yet because we haven't done the, the update step yet. And if you have a look at the meta regularized Mammal, we basically have no clue what's going on here. There's only 5% five accur uh, of accuracy. Um, yeah, so let's have a look at what happens after the, the, the update step. And now you see how drastically the mammal, uh, mammal's uh, accuracy decreases to roughly 8%, which basically shows us that uh, mammal failed to generalize and just uh, overfitted to the given meta training tasks. And in the meta regularization mammal situation, um, we, we get um, a nice 83% of accuracy. And this is basically a testimonial um, from them to tell us that the regularization technique works. Okay. But there might still be some issues with this uh, meta regularized mammal. What if uh, our task distribution is, is too narrow? What does that mean too narrow? It's a, um, it, the task could be too closely related. But I will come back to this point in the end when we um, introduce the uh, meta world. So here we're having a, a quick question session again. So this is me handing over to you, Stefan. Do we have any questions that want um, to get answered right now to this chapter? So far, no one is raising their hands and I think we have to speed up a bit anyway. Otherwise, we're gonna go way over the one hour limit that's planned. Maybe okay. I can have a, a quick question. Um, so could you maybe explain again this shuffling of labels? What's the yeah. plan? Why do you do this? And so, yeah, go. Okay, and um, why, why did we shuffle those labels? So let me, let, let us assume that we perfectly trained the, the task one situation, which means, okay, our, our meta um, parameters have already learned how to classify a dog as a label three and the butterfly as a label four. So if you would do now a, um, an adaption towards the, the task two sample, um, we could basically just uh, use our, our old knowledge that we have already in the old experience that we've already learned and then classify the butterfly right away. And the same goes for the dog without even having a look at task two's training data. And this is something we want to avoid um, has that clarified or do you want to ask a follow-up question on this here? No, thanks. That, that helps. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the question. Okay. Do we have um, any other question at this point? Does not seem like that. So I think we can just go on and ask the questions at the end if, in case there are any. Okay. Let me uh, speed up a bit as, uh, as requested. Um, now we, we're going over to the next uh, paper, which is um, talking about the meta gradient reinforcement learning. And this time around, we're online meta learning the discount factor. And I will also drop the, the update formula again, such that you get the high level idea what what is happening. Um, what is inter interesting is that they achieved uh, a, state, a new state-of-the-art performance on the Atari games. And, and the takeaway is that you could boost massively your uh, returns by meta-learning a discount factor. Um, yeah, so as promised, here again, a reminder about the Q-learning update rule. Um, I highlighted what we're working on right now. Um, and which is the discount factor here, which comes in place uh, here in the formula. Um, yeah, so by just tweaking this uh, discount factor, we get uh, a substantial boost in the performance of, of the entire of the agent. 
and how do they do that? Let's have a quick look at the uh, policy gradient and what it means. So essentially, if you, if you look this right side, that's just like an update uh, as, a, as a gradient of, of a loss function, you basically update the current theta. So how, how do we uh, come up with this um, update loss? So first of all, like the, 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 the simplest case would be if we would just um, differentiate our policy, hence policy gradients, according to the theta t in order to improve on the theta. But it turns out it somehow performs way better if we just um, use the weight here, which is um, this g eta is essentially the, the reward fu function and this um, b is the value function. So you're basically looking at the, at the current value and how much of a reward you could gain. And then you also reweight it according to the probability of taking an action A given the theta T. And the blue part is the way how everyone writes it in the, in the, in the papers. Um, nothing to worry here. Um, yeah. And what, what uh, they want to do here in this uh, meta gradient reinforcement learning is to automatically um, uh, fine tune the hyperparameter, in this case, the gamma. As you see, the, uh, the meta parameters here called uh, eta, I highlighted the gamma, but we also have a lambda in this, uh, this situation here. But uh, throughout the paper, they basically um, don't really touch this uh, lambda here. So the, the big improvement is based on just the uh, hyper parameter tuning and the, the meta learning onto the discount factor. So yeah, so the beauty about this uh, meta grading control algorithm is that it uh, works online. So as we go, we, we update our um, uh, hyper uh, our, our meta parameters uh, uh, discount uh, factor gamma. So this is a simple update um, function as you saw in a different form just before. And first of all, we just update our um, theta, uh, nothing special, but then you see we already have here our meta parameters. So what also happens is like at each step here, T, we also um, compute the derivative according to this uh, update function in order and accumulated it into this set in order to tell how, how this eta was influencing um, um, this F term. And yeah, more formulas here. So what, what I didn't mention is um, we're using here the A to C update function. So I assume you know what A to C means for the others that don't. A to C is, a, is an actor critic um, uh, paradigm where you essentially have uh, one network that tries to learn or a paradigm where you try to learn the policy function and the value function at the same time by improving them at the same time. Um, if you think of GANs, it's, it's like a similar notion. Good, but for the cross-validation itself, so if you just um, meta train on, on, on an episode tau, we can just take whatever comes after this tau and uh, cross-validate it on this. And during cross-validation, we basically only look at the policy grading itself. This is why we had like a, a closer look at this thing before. Um, okay. And then you obviously have also to, to update the meta parameters eta which is being done by uh, this uh, lovely J here, which you just saw before, which is just a policy function, but I didn't plug it in here. Um, yeah, and in this set prime, we basically accumulate our, our derivatives uh, of this uh, update step of our thetas. Okay, and here's just uh, um, a definition just like to, to give you a glimpse how this A to C objective looks like. Um, as, as just a reminder, the, the cross-validation itself just used this first term. But since we're doing a, 
um, uh, actor critic. We are having a policy gradient here, and this part here, as, as um, mentioned up here, is uh, the uh, prediction objective. And then we also have a regularizer. But the most important part is that we have a, a, a loss function that contains the control objective and the prediction objective. Good. Okay, now we're already coming to the results. And I basically ran this uh, on the Atari games. And they also human normalized that. So a human being basically um, gets 100%. And yeah, you try to be above 100%. So at the time when they published that paper, the rainbow algorithm, um, uh, which is also, um, um, which is linked down down in the reference was the state of the art and you if you do human starts you end up having uh, a delta of let me quickly compute that a delta of a staggering 140 percent improvement in this part and over here we have uh, an improvement of uh, 65 percent which is also quite substantial since we're looking at the median um, scores here. Okay. Um, this would be the part where we could um, uh, also, um, wait for questions from your side. But Stephanie, is it okay if, if I just go on and also do the meta world part? Yes, you can go on to meta world. <laughs> okay. Let me see if, if that works. Okay. Um, again, a brief overview of what we're looking at here. We're looking at this brand new open source simulated benchmark, which features 50 distinct uh, robot manipulation tasks. And we will see some pictures um, of, of those tasks and to see what, uh, what it means, uh, what the task is. Um, so the issue up to now here is that we essentially didn't really have before them, before MetaWorld, we didn't really have like some sort of an, an uh, established uh, benchmark. Um, like, uh, like in, in other areas. So in all of those previous papers, um, uh, especially in the mammal regime, they had to uh, um, subsample from Omligot, for instance, in order to create a, an imbalanced data set and so forth. So which also bears a lot of issues with it because this way, if you're basically building all, if you're always building your own data set, you could just flatter yourself without being 100% um, uh, um, honest with yourself. So here with this meta world, they are introducing uh, an outside benchmark and they also added um, different difficulties, uh, difficulty levels. So how does it look like? So what we've been talking um, so far is, um, uh, is about this situation, they call it NL1, is where you have one task and it just varies, for instance, in the position of the goal. So this robot tries to, um, uh, tries to, to, to uh, grab this disk and pick it up or place it. And you just randomize the, the goal and then you hope that if you um, toss it a task task with an unseen goal that it performs quite well in, in doing so. But this is what they call a narrow data um, a task distribution. Um, so by just learning this, it doesn't really mean that we, we also learn to, uh, how to open a, a window, for instance. So by doing this, let me go back over here. By doing this, we essentially just have a, a parametric uh, task variation, uh, which is fine by itself by just learning this one task. But if you want to do proper meta learning, you might also want to include uh, non-parametric um, task variations, we could, which could be um, opening a window. And by learning how to, to reach that puck, you essentially could argue that you also learn how to do the movement to open, slide open this window. Um, yeah, let me go over here again. And here we have the, the second level of difficulty, ML10, where we now have also the ML1 situation with taking place. But now we have 10 different tasks 
for instance, reaching, dial turning, um, playing basketball and so forth. And the test sets contains five unseen uh, test tasks like drawer opening or sweeping and so forth. So the notion here is that, for instance, um, I don't know, shelf, shelf placing could be related with the uh, pick and place of a puck. And we could also argue that by, by learning this drawer opening task that we have the basic movements somehow encoded um, here in the training task that a combination of this, in other words, the combination of a training task could end up helping solving this test task. Hence, reduce the uh, amount of uh, adaption um, update steps. Okay, and this is the third level um, that they have, which contains, uh, which is called ML45, as you see over here. Um, we have 45 different tasks, and again, five unseen tasks as before, but by having 45, it's even more difficult to, to train, to meta learn that. Okay, let's go back over here. Um, yeah, so they addressed uh, the, this issue of uh, a task distribution being very narrow by, uh, um, by creating this ML10 and ML45. And yeah, it just incorporates a, a large number of simulated robots, uh, robotic uh, manipulation tasks. And now you might wonder, like, how do those already um, somehow famous uh, algorithms learn? Like if you have a look at the mammal, for instance, at, on ML10, um, it basically just reaches a success rate of roughly 20%. And the best one here, which is RL squared, which we didn't talk uh, uh, about, um, has a success rate of, of 50%. What does a success rate of 50% mean? It's basically 50, 50 chance that the robot managed to open a door, for instance, which is, kind of sad. And it gets even worse if we move on uh, a level up of difficulty and towards the M45. There we get at most about 35 uh, success rate with the RL2. And what you see in those graphs, it's also contained down here. This is why I don't really want to touch up on it. And this is the moment where we hopefully, yes, get to the Q&A. Um, let me quickly um, summarize what you saw today. So first, we did a quick um, introduction into reinforcement learning, just the most important notions for this talk. Second, we had a look what meta learning means, like in a broader sense, also trying to explain what, it, uh, what, what the main goal of meta learning is. And then we took um, a few deep dives um, into those um, rather current papers where we um, were first just uh, adjusting the, the policy function itself by playing around with this theta. And by playing around this theta, we essentially learned like an I uh, ideal initialization of those weights of this deep learning, uh, of this deep neural network, which is essentially encoding the policy function. And the other way how to use meta learning was the, by meta learn the, the discount uh, factor in a more core reinforcement learning manner. So, uh, and to round up, we ended up seeing that also new benchmarks are being introduced, which essentially just tells in a very polite way that the current algorithms aren't really cutting it and is in a way in itself also challenging the research field to do better. Um, yeah, so um, uh, having said this, I, I want to thank you, the analytics club, to uh, give me the possibility to also present you guys what is happening in the deep reinforcement learning, especially in the meta learning scene. Um, thank you for being, uh, for stalking around until now. And yeah, so I'm open for questions.